It was an age of great political figures. Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, shown here, and others, John Quincy Adams, Martin Van Buren, Thomas Hart Benton, statesmen of whom any age or country could be proud. And the man who towered above them and gave his name to the age was Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, the people's choice, seventh president of the United States. The age of Jackson. It was a time of rapid expansion, energetic growth for the young nation, and vital change. Democracy was in the air. Alexis de Tocqueville, the French traveler and keen observer, wrote, It is evident to all alike that a great democratic revolution is going on amongst us. The nature of what is called Jacksonian democracy has long been the subject of great historical debate. As president, Andrew Jackson persistently held three convictions. First, he believed that the government belonged to all the people and that the majority should rule. Second, he believed in the power of the presidency. And third, he believed that the union must be preserved. Political democracy gained important victories in the Jackson years. Many qualifications for voting and office holding were removed. Voters gained more power as the number of elected rather than appointed officials increased and their terms of office shortened. King Caucus was deposed. With political reforms came a growing spirit of social reform. Movements arose to abolish slavery, ensure free public education, improve the lot of workers, care for the insane and other unfortunates. There was a new concern for the welfare of people. It should be noted, however, that the existence of slavery was not challenged by Jackson and his followers, nor did political reform include women's suffrage. And the age of Jackson was a bleak time for Native Americans. When Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall issued a decision prohibiting Georgia from seizing Cherokee Indian lands, Jackson argued that the decision was contrary to the people's interest. He reportedly said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it and the Jackson administration supervised the removal of the Cherokees to a reservation in Oklahoma. Thousands died during the long forced trek west. Their route is called the Trail of Tears. Some historians believe that Jackson's attitude toward Native Americans was his least attractive characteristic. The second conviction Jackson held was his belief in the power of the presidency. One of his first steps was to remove many of his political opponents from office and to replace them with people who had supported his candidacy. To the victor belong the spoils, observed one Jackson supporter. In a country where offices are created solely for the benefit of the people, Jackson said, no one man has any more intrinsic right to official station than another. Rotation in office, Jackson contended, was democratic because it prevented a permanent class of office holders from becoming an aristocracy. Although Jackson actually replaced only about 20% of all federal office holders, he established a precedent in the use of the spoils system that later presidents followed with drastic results. But some historians believe that Jackson's rationale was in keeping with the new frontier spirit in Washington. Public office, in historian Frederick Jackson Turner's phrase, was a birthright, an opportunity to exercise natural rights as an equal citizen. But to 19th century historian James Barton, Jackson opened the doors of government to ill-bred rabble, to barbarians. As shown in this cartoon of the time, Jackson surrounded himself with a group of unofficial advisors, dubbed the kitchen cabinet by his enemies, implying that the advisors entered the White House by the back door and met in secret. 20th century historian Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., differs from Parton. Schlesinger argued that Jackson brought a healthy democratic influence to American politics, and he viewed the Jackson era as one of steadily expanding political opportunity. The third conviction Jackson held was his belief in the Union. 
the nation must be preserved as a whole at any cost. He stuck by this commitment when he faced the first of two vital issues of his presidency, nullification. In 1828, Western and Northern congressmen secured passage of a tariff that provided high rates on imports. Southerners called it the Tariff of Abominations. Vice President John C. Calhoun, leading spokesman of the South, wrote a secret protest. He argued that the federal government was created by a compact among the states, that the states have the power to declare laws of Congress null and void, and that, as a last resort, a state could secede from the Union. The controversy came to a head in the Senate in a debate between Robert Y. Hayne of South Carolina, who presented the state's rights arguments, and Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, who presented the nationalist point of view. Webster's speech is considered by some historians to be the greatest ever delivered in the Senate. He concluded with the words, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. At the 1830 Jefferson Day dinner, looking directly at Calhoun, Jackson proposed a toast, our federal union, it must be preserved. Calhoun proposed a counter toast, the union, next to our liberty, most dear. When Congress passed the tariff of 1832, South Carolina passed an ordinance of nullification and threatened secession. Jackson acted swiftly. He asked Congress to authorize him to use force to sustain federal authority. No state or states has a right to secede, Jackson said. Nullification therefore means insurrection and war, and other states have a right to put it down. Henry Clay, the great compromiser, proposed a compromise tariff which enabled South Carolina to rescind its ordinance. The Union had been preserved, and Old Hickory's popularity increased as the nation continued its westward push relentlessly. In 1820, settlers had been permitted to purchase as little as 80 acres at $1.25 per acre. But many settlers merely occupied public land as squatters. Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri was leading spokesman for the West in congressional debates. He fought without compromise to promote the interests of the West, especially for cheap land for pioneers. The so-called preemption laws were passed, which gave squatters first right to buy the lands they had occupied and farmed. Disputes centering on the sale of public lands and the use of the proceeds, along with the tariff issue, emphasized sectional differences. However, the conflict between Democrats and the National Republicans, according to historian Schlesinger, was a conflict not of sections, but of classes. In his view, Jacksonian democracy did not stem from the rough and ready egalitarianism of the Western frontier. It was an effort, Schlesinger wrote, to control the power of the capitalist groups, mainly Eastern, for the benefit of non-capitalist groups, farmers and laboring men, East, West, and South. Schlesinger drew an analogy between Jacksonian democracy and President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. Both were struggles of large sections of the populace against a business elite and its allies. But historian Richard Hofstetter argued that there is one critical difference. The New Deal was based on the premise that economic expansion had come to an end. Jacksonian democracy, that expansion had just begun. America has always been a country on the move, but in the 1930s, people moved out of despair. In the 1830s, people moved for land, for opportunity. Indeed, the movement of people dramatized the kinds of change that ultimately shaped the Jackson era and the country. Within one generation, between 1810 and 1830, over two million people crossed the Appalachians. Six new states were formed. At first they moved slowly, on foot, by flatboat, horse, and wagon. Six weeks from New York City to the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi in 1800. Two weeks in 1830, as Americans increasingly used a growing network of canals, traveling by steamboat, later by rail. Time is money, as Benjamin Franklin once advised a young tradesman, and improved transportation cut the costs of carrying produce and goods dramatically. Farmers flourished as American surpluses of wheat, 
cotton, tobacco, and naval stores flowed into Eastern and European markets. Commerce expanded. Cities grew by leaps and bounds. Over a half million immigrants came to these shores between 1828 and 1844. Germans, Irish, Scots, Welsh, and others. Technology flourished. New methods developed for rolling copper and brass, for manufacturing iron tubing, new forms of lathes and planes, drills, gear cutters, and dies, nails, tacks, bolts, files, spikes, wire screws, and chains, all formerly produced by hand, were now machine-made. The country literally seethed with activity. As Daniel Webster observed at the onset of the Jacksonian era, society is full of excitement, competition comes in place of monopoly, and intelligence and industry ask only for fair play and an open field. Some historians view Jacksonian democracy as the people's response to monopoly, aristocratic privilege, and other obstacles to fair play and an open field. In recent years, Sean Willens, for example, traces the growth of an industrial workforce in New York City with an increasing class identity. These workers, Willens argued, attack the emerging system of laissez-faire capitalism and the wage system, which together they believe threaten to close off their chances for advancement and opportunity, to cut off fair play and an open field. Historian Marvin Myers, writing in the 1950s, takes a somewhat different view. He argued that Jacksonians mistrusted the new industrial society and yearned instead for the restoration of an earlier agrarian society with simple virtues such as self-reliance and with limited federal government. Other historians, among them Lee Benson and Glyndon Van Dusen, writing in the 1960s, have maintained that there was no consistent class, regional or economic differences between the Jacksonians and anti-Jacksonians. Both parties, Benson contended, contained big as well as small businessmen, farmers and city workers, and both favored greater equality of opportunity. Local and cultural factors such as religion and ethnic background, in his view, determined party loyalty, not economic interests or class distinctions. For many historians, however, Jackson's differences with Clay and Webster and his bitter fight against the Second Bank of the United States reflected sectional differences, class distinctions, and social and economic divisions in the nation. The bank was chartered in 1816 as a private profit-making corporation, its headquarters in Philadelphia with branches in 29 other cities. Four-fifths of the bank's stock was held by private investors and one-fifth by the federal government. The bank served as the official depository for government funds and sold government bonds. The Northeast generally supported the bank since manufacturers and financial interests benefited from available investment capital and stable currency. The South and the West both opposed the bank. Planters, farmers, and debtors generally preferred state banks since these would bring easy credit, cheap money, and high prices for agricultural goods. Jackson immediately cast the fight against the bank as one against privilege. He charged that the bank was a tool of rich Easterners and that it engaged in questionable political activities. By granting loans to congressmen, Jackson contended, the bank was able to influence legislation. Nicholas Biddle, president of the bank, acting on the advice of Henry Clay, who supported the bank, requested a new charter from Congress. Jackson's enemies hoped to make the bank the leading issue of the 1832 election, and they succeeded. Jackson vetoed the rechartered bill. As this cartoon indicates, Jackson's enemies referred to him as King Vito and King Andrew I. They called themselves Whigs, as had the opponents of King George III during the American Revolution. Henry Clay ran against Jackson in 1832. This anti-Jackson election cartoon depicts Clay on a fast horse, winning the race from Jackson whose donkey is about to stumble over the power of the bank. The cartoonist was mistaken. Once again, Jackson rallied the common people to his support, receiving 219 electoral votes to Clay's 49. And Jackson interpreted his re-election as a mandate from the people to destroy the bank. 
1832 cartoon depicts Jackson driving away the bank's corrupt supporters by ordering the withdrawal of government deposits, which he placed in state banks called pet banks by Jackson's enemies. This move effectively crippled the second bank of the United States. Jackson's victory over Biddle and the bank is viewed by some historians as a victory of the common people over a powerful economic monopoly and over a potential threat to democratic government. Other historians disagree. The state banks engaged in an orgy of imprudent practices. Nicknamed wildcat banks, they made unwise loans and printed far more paper money than was justified by their reserves of specie. Alarmed by these practices, Jackson in 1836 issued his Specie Circular, instructing federal land agents to accept payment for public lands only in gold or silver. Some historians say that the financial crisis called the Panic of 1837 was a direct result of Jackson's actions. By distributing federal funds among state banks, he started a credit boom that broke disastrously, and he deprived the country of a sound, effective bank, currency, and credit system. Martin Van Buren, Jackson's friend and successor as president, influenced Congress to pass the Independent Treasury Act. By this law, the government established sub-treasuries in various cities and kept its funds in its own safety vaults. But Van Buren did little to ease the panic and the ensuing depression, and he was swept from office in the election of 1840. The Whigs won easily following a campaign marked by slogans such as Van Van is a used up man, and Tippecanoe and Tyler too. General William Harrison, victor over the Indians at the Battle of Tippecanoe, became president, and John Tyler became vice president. Andrew Jackson died in 1845, but the Jacksonian era continued to influence American life, and historians have disagreed about the nature of Jacksonian democracy and about the man himself. Was the age of Jackson a wind of democracy from the West, a challenge to aristocratic power, a demand for fair play and an open field, the age of the common man, a desire for the simplicity of earlier times. As with other issues on which historians differ, their views of Jackson and his era have often reflected the political climate of their own time. What is the legacy of Jacksonian democracy in your opinion? <laughs>